Well, this morning, we're going to continue with our study in the book of Acts. Last week, I was able to make it through a whole chapter. Which, let me tell you something, that's quite of an accomplishment for this preacher. Uh, I'd like to spend a whole morning in one verse of Scripture and do a verse or two a week. But I'm trying my best to uh, keep moving because I want you to get the full benefit, but I don't want to get too bogged down. And, uh, but today I'm going to have to tell you we're not going to make it through all of chapter 2. We're going to make it about halfway through, and we'll go from there. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and start in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And I didn't give uh, Jacob uh, any verses. I just realized this morning, so we may have to give him a moment to keep up with us. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Again, I could spend all morning on this phrase, but we're going to take just about a minute to cover it. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, do you think Jesus had a specific reason for choosing this particular day to pour out His Spirit on the disciples and those that were gathered. I think maybe so. There was a reason that it was poured out. He was poured out on this day. You see, there were three Jewish, Jewish feasts, major Jewish feasts, that drew large crowds to Jerusalem each year. And Pentecost was one of them. Now, if you're wondering, Pentecost means 50th. That's what the word Pentecost means, 50th. And it came 50 days after Passover. For we Christians, we say it's 50 days after Easter, amen? Because Easter is our Christian Passover. And uh, uh, I think most of you might understand what Passover is. Back in Egypt, uh, whenever the plagues were being poured out, God said He's going to wipe out uh, the firstborn of every family. But he told the Israelites to put blood uh, on their uh, doorpost, and when the angel saw the blood, he would pass over their house. Amen. And today, we as Christians, when G when when uh, Jesus sees the blood, uh, judgments passed over us in that final hour. Amen. Hallelujah. Now you can see why I'd like to preach on that for a while, but uh, we're we're going to keep moving here. But uh, again. Uh, Pentecost was also known as the Feast of Harvest. And how significant is it that the Holy Spirit came and there was a harvest of souls that day? Amen? The Bible tells us that there were some 3,000 added to the church that day. In other words, 3,000 decisions to receive Christ. Isn't that good? I'd like to have a, a, an altar call like that. Amen? Of course, we had to go round up from somewhere else because there's not 3,000 of you in here. Close, but not quite 3,000. But it goes on to say, they were all with one accord in one place. So they were all together. They were all in one accord. Uh, that word accord means to be in agreement. They were all in agreement or harmony. So here they all are. They're all in agreement. And that's quite a feat in itself, isn't it? To get some 120 people together in agreement. They were in unity. They were of the same mind. They had the same purpose. And the Holy Spirit loves unity. The Holy Spirit loves unity. Pastors also love unity. Amen? And uh, I just thank God for this church that I don't have to just constantly go around putting fires out. You know, that there, there's a unity in the house, and I love that. And uh, I'll tell you, who doesn't love unity is the enemy. Amen? And he's the one that's always trying to bring about discord. But uh, don't listen to him. Amen? Get an agreement to be in unity and to fulfill the purposes of God in your life and in the life of your church and your city. You know, I had the opportunity to meet with several pastors uh, here the last month or so. And it's been a joy. I don't get to go as often as I'd like to, but they pray together weekly and they have a monthly breakfast. And, 
and uh, I, I was able to go to one prayer meeting anyway, and uh, one breakfast, and it's, God's doing something in Evansville. He's bringing pastors together, which is something Evansville's not known for. Now, when I was in Madisonville, there was a great unity of, of a lot of pastors there, and they did things together in the city, and, and so I'm excited about that, I'm excited about getting to go again and be a part of that, but uh, that's how we'll bring the city to Jesus, amen? Not one church can do it. It takes us coming together. And uh, we can put aside certain differences, amen, for the sake of reaching people for Jesus. Now, we don't put important things aside. You know, we don't put things aside. And, and we don't have to get an agreement on what we believe. But if we believe that Jesus is the way of salvation, amen, then we can come together and introduce people to Jesus that way. And I'm excited about that. All right. Verse 2 of Acts chapter 2. And it reads there, and suddenly, suddenly a sneeze is about to happen here. <laughs> Thank you. They usually come in threes. Okay, well maybe we'll get by with two this time. Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were setting. Notice the words, and suddenly. Everybody just say suddenly. 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 You know, God many times works suddenly. You know, we might pray and pray and pray and pray and feel like nothing is happening, but then suddenly you see the breakthrough. Anybody ever had that happen in your life? Amen? Suddenly. It feels like it just came out of nowhere. You know, Today's Mother's Day, and Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. And, uh, uh, you know, as you can see, I chose not to go with a Mother's Day message today, but we do plan to honor each of you uh, before the service is over. Now, speaking of mothers, you know, I always, of course, think of my mother on Mother's Day. Uh, as most many of you know, she passed away the day before Mother's Day 15 years ago. And uh, then, of course, Cheryl's dad passed away the day after Mother's Day, uh, the same year. And uh, uh, but I got to thinking, you know, about mothers. And I tell you, I was, I was probably the hardest child to raise. Uh, well, probably, no, probably to it, undoubtedly. I was I was the troubled one. I was the troubled teenager. I was the one that was uh, you know, always getting in trouble. And uh, she prayed for me. Let me tell you something. I had a praying mother. And I would come in and, and uh, she'd have the Bible open with a verse mark for me to read. And, and uh, you know, she, she'd wake me up with a belt sometimes. And, you know, I mean, she uh, did everything she could to keep me uh, straight. And, you know, it, she, of course, raised this by herself because my dad, dad passed away when I was four. But, uh, you know, I think about her and her praying for me and praying for me to come to the Lord and, and uh, to walk with Him. And I tell you, I know it looked hopeless to her because I was just getting worse and worse and worse. But something happened in the natural that God made a supernatural moment out of. And suddenly, I had a change of mind. And it wasn't too long after that until I got saved and came to the Lord. And then just right after that, a matter of months, I got called into the ministry. So you see, things can happen suddenly. I was the least, I mean, if they took a, a vote in high school of the least likely person to become a preacher, my name probably would have been uh, voted on as the least likely. But you know, God takes the foolish things. Amen to confound the ones. And not only that, but uh, I was not good at public speaking. I couldn't hardly, unless I had a little artificial help, I couldn't hardly talk in front of more than two or three people. And, uh, and then I said, God, if you want to call me into preaching and ministry, you've got some work to do. Well, at least he did some good work on the part where I can get up and it's hard to shut me up now. So, you know, at least he did that much. But uh, anyway... Things can look hopeless. And this is a word to you moms, to you grandmas, to grandpas and dads. 
You know, don't give up. Amen? Because God can do a work suddenly. Even when it seems like it's the most hopeless situation, God can do a work. And God wants to do a work. Amen? So that is what they were doing. They were praying. They were all gathered together. All of a sudden, it says there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Now, it doesn't say that there was a wind. I mean, it doesn't say that people were, were blown around the room. It says there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. You know, it could have sounded like a hurricane. I really don't know what a hurricane sounds like. Never been in one. Or it could have been the sound of, of a tornado. Now, I do know what a tornado sounds like. I've been close enough to tornadoes to know what they sound like. And it's true, they sound like a train. Anybody ever heard a tornado? Does it sound like a train? I'm not going to try to imitate because I'm not very good at imitating sounds. But it sounded like a train. Choo -choo. No. <laughs> no, it had the roar of a train. Now, it didn't come and go. It says it came and it filled the house. In other words, it, it just was there. And that sound had to be deafening. And, and it had to be awesome and thrilling and scary. All wrapped up into one emotion. Amen? Verse 3 goes on to say, Then, after this sound, it says, There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. So you have this sound, and all of a sudden they see this like flames of fire coming and just sitting on them. A fire began to burn on them. It burned in their hearts and it burned in their mouths. Kind of reminds me of Luke 24 and verse 32. And it reads in Luke 24 32, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while we talked? while He talked with us on the road, and while He opened the Scriptures to us. Have you ever had your heart just burn with the presence of the Lord? I mean, you could just feel the warmth of His presence and the power of His presence. Well, multiply that. And, and they, they were experiencing the Lord in raw form right here. The Holy Spirit. There's an overwhelming presence of God in the room. And it says... Uh, it was with them and on them. Church, there's nothing to compare with being overwhelmed by the presence of God. If you have never experienced the manifested presence of God, I pray that you will. There is just something it will change your life. You know, the old Pentecostals used to say, it's better felt than tell. You know, we, we can, you know, somebody who has had a, a, an experience like that can, and I have on many occasions, uh, uh, you know, you can try to tell somebody what it's like, but you just can't really describe what it really was like. But there's something that uh, is worth seeking the presence of God. Amen. This was not the only time that. People are overwhelmed with the presence of God. That may have been the most powerful manifestation of the presence of God, but there have been great revivals and great outpourings of the Holy Spirit even in modern times. Because I live in modern times and I've experienced great outpourings. And I tell you, church, it, it's, it's, a, it's and, and the word awesome is used too freely nowadays, but it is truly an awesome experience to be in the presence of God. <laughs> then we look at verse 4. And it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. We're going to talk about uh, uh, tongues. We're going to talk about uh, uh, these different things. You know, it just amazes me. Some people just really have a problem with tongues. I don't understand why people have such a problem with tongues. You know, if you don't, if a person doesn't believe that, so what? What harm is this person doing 
thinking they're doing something, you know, that uh, you don't believe is real. Be careful what you say sometimes, because there's been manifestations that Cheryl and I, years ago, you know, that made fun of, next thing you know, guess who the Holy Spirit comes on? <laughs> so you got to be careful sometimes what you say. So, let's take a look at this. Let me read that again. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak with tongues. And these usually go hand in hand. Speaking in tongues is an evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not dogmatic about it. I'm not going to say you can't be baptized in the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues. But I'll say you can't speak in tongues without being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just tell you why I said that. Let me just briefly share my experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was a good Southern Baptist boy. Preacher at that. And a friend of mine moved to Florida and, and found out about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was baptized in the Holy Spirit, so, you know, he started sending me little booklets and little tapes and telling me how I needed to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the church that I grew up in, Calvary Baptist Church, no longer with us, it's a uh, Hope, or I can't remember the name of it right now. But anyway, uh, they never spoke against tongues. They just never talked about it. You know, it was just something. So I didn't have a lot of negative things like some people do. It's the devil, it's this, it's that. But So I didn't have, really have anything. I was kind of a blank slate. And so I read them, and, and you know, I kind of didn't really think it was real and, and what have you. But then Bill, uh, uh, James Robinson came to Bethel Temple back in the day. And I'm talking back when I was around 20, 21, something like that. And he said something. He said, the same power that raised Jesus Christ's dead body from the grave lives in you, and you are willing to live a defeated life. That has stuck with me. Matter of fact, I had the, 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 the opportunity about four years ago to go up to James Robinson and talk to him and say, hey, you said something back early on in my ministry that changed my life, my ministry, and the way I look at things, and I shared that quote with him, and he remembered it. So it was pretty neat. And uh, so anyway, I, wasn't, I didn't feel like I was living a defeated life, but the thought occurred to me, there's more. All of what I'm experiencing right now, I'm excited about Jesus, I'm telling people about Jesus, but I just felt there was something in me that said, there's more. So I began to take the baptism of the Holy Spirit more seriously. And so I began to seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'd ask God, God, I just ask for, you know, the baptism of the Spirit, this is a view I wanted, on and on and on and on and on. And actually, I don't suggest you do this, but I'm not almost begging. I don't think we have to beg God for gifts, amen? We just need to be hungry, desire, and open. So anyway, I do all this. I had to move to Florida. I'm kind of getting a little lengthy with my story here, so let me just kind of move to the end. I went to a camp meeting, a tent meeting, actually. It was in Bradenton, Florida, where I was living at the time. And I was going to World Life Christian Center, which was a charismatic-type church back in the early 80s when that was really big. And uh, anyway, they had this tent meeting, and they had a, an evangelist there named Sandy Brown. Now, Sandy Brown was a playboy, bunny, cocktail waitress turned holiness preacher. I try to get that. And she's got an excellent uh, testimony. I thought about trying to have her come someday. I looked her up on the web here a while back. She's still around. So, uh, but she was, she was, uh, she said, everybody, I want all the ministers to come forward. I want to pray for you. Some of you heard this story. But, I, you know, I was just kind of starting out in the ministry. I wasn't pastor or anything, but I was preaching. And I knew God had called me, so I came up with everybody else. And so she's praying for people. And she's like walking up going, Doo! and they fall down. And she'd be, you know, just doing this, and they fall down, and they fall down, and they fall down. And she got up to me, she was saying different things to them. And you have to understand, she didn't know me, she didn't know what I was doing, and she just said, Receive the Spirit. Guess what? 
I didn't fall down. I didn't start speaking in tongues. I didn't do anything. I'm just standing there. And she goes to the next person. They fall down. They fall down. I thought, great. I'm going to be the only person, only pastor or minister or whatever standing up here. So finally she gets down. There's about 25 or 30 of us. She gets down to the other end and a couple more were left standing. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm not the only one that's going to look like I'm not spiritual. But you know, you know why people fall down? Because they can't stand up. Amen? And, uh, you know, it doesn't make you any more spiritual whether you fall down or whether you stand up. Matter of fact, in some of the churches I pastor, when God moved that way, so that people wouldn't focus on whether they fall down or not, I had to come sit down. I just had to sit down. Now, I pray that way you're not worried about, am I going to fall, am I not going to fall? No, it doesn't matter whether you fall or don't fall. The only reason you fall is because you can't stand, uh, stand up. So if you're sitting down, and I remember Peggy in Petersburg, I remember, uh, you know, this first time she came to our church, but, you know, she was battling cancer at the time, and, and we prayed for her, and, and I, I tell you, uh, she, she ended up sitting down, and she fell to the chair and sat, but then she almost fell over out of the chair because the Spirit of God came on her, you see. So, it's not a matter of whether you fall down or lay down or, or whatever, it's just receiving what God has for you, amen. So anyway, there I am standing there, and so I just said, okay, I received the Spirit. I received the Holy Spirit. I can say no tongues, no nothing. Well, about three days later, I was praying as I normally did in, in that time. I, I'd either kneel down on my couch uh, or, or on my bed, and I'd pray that way. Well, I'm praying, then all of a sudden, this heavenly language just starts welling up in me, and I just open my mouth and start speaking in tongues. I want you to know I wasn't even smart enough to make it up before. I try abba dabba 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 do. You know, I mean, I, I could not, I could not make up words. But all of a sudden, this this these, these unknown tongues, this heavenly language, just begin to rise up and, and come out. And then I started quoting scripture that I didn't even know. I looked it up later, and I was quoting it verbatim. So I was all, actually, as we'll see here in a moment, some spoke in tongues and prophesied. So I started, I didn't know if that was biblical or not. I was interpreting some of the things that I was even saying. I, did, I mean, I'm a Baptist boy. I don't know what you know the proper way of doing things are here, but this was all by myself several days later. So that's what I'm saying is, yes, speaking in tongues is, is an evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you know, you may be able to speak in tongues, you just haven't settled down to do that. Now I know my assembly brothers would have a hard time with that. Because you stay there until midnight, you know, and they be twisting your tongue and pulling your lips and you know, you're going to speak in tongues tonight. And if you don't, you're not baptizing the Holy Spirit. Well, again, I'm not going to be that dogmatic because I've seen others that had similar experiences. But I'm just saying this, if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can speak in tongues. Amen? You may not be doing it, but you can. So if you feel like you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself open to let that heavenly language Because there is a purpose for that, amen? It's to edify yourself. I think the purpose, and again, I'm not being dogmatic either way, but I think it's more for your personal life than it is for church services. Not that God doesn't do that in church services, okay? We're not against that at all. But I think the, the major importance is in your prayer life and, and spending that time speaking mysteries of the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right. And again, we, we could go on and on and on. And I'm going to just kind of jump around a little bit and show you, uh, uh, first of all, um, I'm going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are those that do not believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second work. What I mean by that is they believe when you get saved, you get it all. Now, you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit you know, baptizes you into the body of Christ and, and, and He abides in you, but there's a power. And that's where the baptism comes in, is receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like you can buy a car that's a regular car, but you can also add supercharge onto it. Amen? And, and the Holy Spirit is kind of like a supercharger for your spiritual life. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. So, let's take a look and see what the Scriptures say about this. Let's start where we are in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. 
Uh, three things I want you to notice. First of all, those that were gathered there were already believers. Amen? They were believers. Then we see that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit because that's what the Scripture tells them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So they were already believers. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had come. And then we see they spoke with tongues. Then we'll jump over to Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. I'm going to read Acts chapter 10, 44 through 46. And it reads there, While Peter was still saying this, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, the Jewish folks, came with Peter and says they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. So here actually we see another evidence. They were extolling God. Amen. They were worshiping God. They were praising God. So here it appears they received Christ when they were baptized. In the whole, or they, they received Christ and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit about the same time here. Now however, salvation must come first. Even if it's a matter of seconds. Because you cannot receive the Holy Spirit unless you are born again. Amen? So even if it was just a matter of seconds, they were born again, then they received the Holy Spirit, and it says they, they spoke in tongues. Then Acts 19, I'm going to read 1 through 6. And it reads there, And it happened while Paulus was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Now, they're disciples, amen, which means they're believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Okay, so we saw they believed. He said, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We do not so much at, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what they were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him, who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So they did this. They had already believed on him. They were baptized in Jesus' name. Then it says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So here they're already saying they're baptized in water, then they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, then they spoke with other tongues, and they prophesied. Let's look at another one. Acts 8, verses 14 through 17. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Again, they were already saved. For as of yet, he had not fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It says, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So here's another time it happened after they already believed. So, they're already believers. They received the Holy Spirit. And I believe they spoke in tongues. It doesn't say they spoke in tongues. However, let me tell you why I believe they did. Uh, uh, something had to have happened because Simon saw that the Holy Spirit had been given. Look at the next verse, verse 18. 18 and 19. It says, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So it kind of seems an obvious conclusion that something happened for him to see that they received the Holy Spirit. And that conclusion, uh, I think, would be that they, they too spoke with other tongues. I don't know exactly what else it would be that would convince him to the point he's like, hey, let me give you some money. I want that. Of course, he got rebuked for that, amen, because you're not, you know, it's let may your money perish with you is what they said to him. Alright? Then I want to share one more 
Uh, we don't necessarily have to go there, but if you remember Paul, who was Saul in the book of Acts, chapter 9, most will agree that Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. Okay? Most would agree with that. I've never really heard anybody that didn't agree with that. Then later on, Ananias, as instructed by the Lord, uh, came to Paul and prayed for him to receive his sight. And it says he laid hands on him to receive the Holy Spirit. So again, he was converted on the road to Damascus. Ananias comes, lays hands on him. And notice that's how many times people receive the Holy Spirit is by the laying on of hands. But we also heard they just heard the Word and the Spirit came on them. So, you know, we got to be careful about putting God in a box and say, God, this is the only way you can do it. We're good about that, aren't we? Now, if it goes against Scripture, of course, we don't agree with that. But if it doesn't go against Scripture, God does have a little freedom on how to do things. All right. So, Ananias lays hands on to receive the Spirit. Now, it does again, it doesn't say that he spoke with tongues. There. But later on, we know, he says, I, Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, or any of you. And, uh, you know, I would say the same thing. I mean, I don't know that I do, but I, I just thank God for, for that gift. Amen? And uh, uh, I would like to emphasize, though, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, again, is not about speaking in tongues. You know, a lot of people think, well, I'll get baptized in the Holy Spirit so I can speak with tongues. That's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. That's just an evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit because unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, you, you can't speak in tongues because it's as the Spirit gives utterance when you receive that power. Amen? So, what is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, okay, let's go back to Acts 1, verse 8. We looked at this last week. Acts 1, 8. And here's where a lot of the church has gotten off because we've made it all about tongues. And I know I just spent 15 minutes talking about it. But I want to share with you what the Scripture does say about it. Amen? And that's why I spent 15 minutes talking about it. But that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose for it. And we've gotten off track a little bit. Everybody seems to be seeking the ability to speak in tongues, but they're not seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of the Holy Spirit. What is that? Acts 1.8. But you shall receive, everybody say it, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Power. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Power to be witnesses. To be the best, most powerful witness that you can be. Some again... Uh, some say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was only for the early church. But let me tell you something. We still need the power to witness. Amen? And if they needed it then, how much more do we need it now? We need power to be a witness for Christ. So as a recap, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the second work of the Holy Spirit. We've seen many occasions speaking in tongues, uh, Follows, again, you're able to, even if you don't. Don't get hung up on that. Amen. Just open your heart and say, God, and this is an honest way of saying it, if it's of you, I want everything you got. Amen. That's the way I look at it. If it's of you, I want everything you've got. And then uh, we see about five times in, in a span of 30 years, people received the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't just that one time in the upper room. And if, if, if I remember correctly, it was over 30 years that these incidences happened that we talked about this morning. So, the ultimate evidence, and here's one that, that we really need to hang on to. What do you think the ultimate evidence would be? Think about it for a moment. I mentioned a couple. I said, of course, speaking in tongues is an evidence. I even said, worship. You know, what did they do whenever they're baptized in the Holy Spirit? They begin to exhort God. They begin to, to worship God, exalt Him. But here is the ultimate evidence 
that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Power. Power. We need the power. Amen? And just because you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're filled with the Spirit. You know, it's two different things, really. Being filled with the Spirit is allowing Him to use you because, you see, He doesn't force Himself on you. He, doesn't, he, he can be quenched. Amen? We, we need to allow Him. I remember uh, my pastor at Calvary Baptist Church, I like the way he said this. To be filled with the Spirit is kind of like how you fill a glove with your hand. You see, that, that glove is just floppy. Whenever you put your hand in there, you begin to control that glove. Amen? And, and as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, He comes in and controls us as we allow Him to control us. Amen? Because again, He doesn't force Himself on us. We have to be open and say, God, I want to be used by You. Show me opportunities to be a witness and, and use my mouth to speak words of truth. You see, many Christians don't even think about witnessing anymore. But we need to be open to the Holy Spirit to tell people about Jesus. You know, I said last week, I believe it was, uh, where people quote Francis of Assisi saying, you know, uh, preach the gospel and when you have to use words. Well, I know I'm not a person because somebody's mobile, but he never said that. And, and Francis of Assisi preached often and he preached alone. So I would be going against, but, but we all know what that quote means. It means let your actions show Christ in you. Amen? But you got to tell them why you do what you do. Amen? Or otherwise, they won't know. So we need to be out and be examples. Be witnesses. You will be a witness. You'll either be a good one or you'll be a bad one. Amen? But you will be witnesses. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to control our lives, to control what we look at, to control what we do with our hands and say with our mouth, when we allow Him to have control, we can be a witness and we can have power to open our mouth with boldness because the righteous, it tells us, are as bold as lions and we can make a difference in people's lives today. But we have to be willing. We're able, but we have to be willing. Okay, let's go back to the upper room. We're almost done. Back here in the upper room, they were so overwhelmed with his presence, they thought he, they, the people thought they were drunk. It says in verse 13 of chapter 2 of Acts. Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Look at verse 11. We see they are full of praise. Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Now they weren't necessarily preaching to these people. They were just glorifying God. They were, they were going about saying, God is wonderful. God is awesome. We just magnify His holy name. I mean, that may not be what they're saying, but something like that. But then they said they, these, these folks that were gathered from every nation heard them praising God in their, their language. <coughs> Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. What is praise and worship? i tell you what it is. It's talking about how great and how wonderful God is. Verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? I mean, they're just common folk. I mean, these weren't folks that had learned a lot of different languages. Amen? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Pergia and Papilia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, 
visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in their own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? I mean, that had to be a sight. Then verse 13 says, Others mocking said, They're full of wine. Again, there were men from every nation. Jesus' disciples were causing such a commotion that they came together. What's going on? They were confused and they were amazed because they heard them speaking in their own language. Now here's something I rarely do, but I'm going to throw it out there. I'm not trying to build a doctrine here, amen. But, how, I mean, how, don't you have thoughts when you read the Bible sometimes? Hmm, I wonder. This is just one of those, hmm, I wonder kind of things. Because I've never heard anybody say this before, so I'm always a little leery uh, of, of stepping out and saying something I've never heard anybody else say before. They may have said it. You may have heard people say this, but I've never heard people say this. I was just wondering, looking at this, a thought occurred to me, that the disciples were not speaking in these known languages, but rather they heard in their own language. You know, they have things today that somebody can be speaking in a language, you put these ear things on, and you actually hear it interpreted in, in you know, in, in your, your earphone. So maybe they were out there just speaking. You see, they're just speaking in an unknown tongue, but yet they're hearing in their own language. Then I wonder, those that mock, maybe they weren't getting that interpretation and they're just out there what appeared to them to be babbling. Or well, they can't even talk right. They must really be drunk. So that's just the thought. Now I'm going to close. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we will come back and visit periodically on this subject. But how do you receive the Holy Spirit? First of all, you ask Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit because Jesus is the baptizer. Amen? How do you get saved? You ask Jesus to come into your heart. How do you get baptized with the Holy Spirit? It says, you know, if you ask Him for a, a, a bread, he, you know, He's not going to give you a snake or, a, you know, or some of that nature. Amen? He's not going to give you something bad. He's going to give you something good. He's, he's the giver of good gifts. Amen? Secondly, I believe there needs to be a, a, a real hunger. There needs to be a real desire. I do not really think you're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Go ahead and do that, God. I think there needs to be a little more desire than that. Amen? And actually, I'm kind of starting to feel that way about salvation, to be honest with you. Because I think sometimes people want to raise their hand just like, yeah, sure, why not? That's not really a heartfelt receiving Christ. You see, I mean, you know, he told his disciples, he said, you know, count the cost. You see, when we receive Christ, we really do need to count the cost. Because that means we're giving our lives over to Him. Amen? And whenever we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're saying we are opening ourselves up for, for the Holy Spirit to use us in power. It's not just so I can say, I got it. Except for a lot of people are today, you know. Uh, and, and a lot of pastors, a lot of churches are like, hey, we, we baptized 15 people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. Well, you didn't baptize anybody in the Holy Spirit. Jesus did. If it's going to get done, it's not because of you, it's not because of me, but it's because of Him and what He does. That's one thing we're definitely not into around here is you know, how many people we get to come up and pray for. Yes, this should be a house of prayer, but, but we're not about bragging about, you know, and if we talk about people getting saved, it's just because we're excited. They got saved. Amen? Now, I'm not putting other churches down. I'm sure that's their motives too, but sometimes we can get things out of whack. So I believe, I believe there needs to be a, a real hunger and desire. Then thirdly, I do believe we need to expect a sign, whether it be tongues, uh, all of a sudden you're just magnifying and worshiping God more than you ever did, or all of a sudden you're just feeling a boldness and a power within you to witness. But I still want to say... Uh, Make yourself open for the gift of tongues that God, or for that prayer language, because it is so beneficial. Sometimes when you're praying, you just don't know how to pray. Have you ever been there? You know, you want to pray for somebody, you just don't know how to do it. But you know, you can just be thinking of that person and praying, 
in the Holy Spirit and know that the Spirit's praying through you for that person. It's awesome. So desire. It, the Bible tells us desire all the gifts. And I'll close with this. Above all, desire the love. Amen? Desire the love. Love's the greatest. And let's make a choice to love one another. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, that's as far as I'm going to get today. I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. I want to give you a moment just to speak with the Lord. I've heard a preacher say one time, anytime you preach on a subject, you need to give an opportunity for people to respond to that message. And this morning, you know, I'm not going to call you up, but right where you're sitting, if you had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you would like to just say, Lord, I want to ask you this morning to baptize me in your precious Holy Spirit. I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Just ask Him. Say, Lord, I want to be baptized in your Holy Spirit. I want everything that you have for me. I want to be used by you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to come right now. Lord, we ask you to come. We ask you, Lord, to answer the call that's going to you right now by individuals. And I say to them, as was spoken to me many years ago, I say receive the Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit right now. Receive the Spirit right now. Hallelujah. Lord, you see the hearts, you see those that are hungry. You see those that are desiring more of you right now. More of your power. Use us, Lord, in this hour to be a witness. Baptize us with your power. Baptize us with your Holy Spirit to bring that power. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Would you just rub your hands? Just begin to worship Him. And just speak words of praise to Him. Tell Him you love Him this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we magnify You. We glorify You, Lord. We exalt Your name together right now. Your King of kings, Your Lord of lords, Hallelujah. Be glorified. Be magnified. Be lifted up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. You are worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. I want you to look up at me now if you would. If you call out and ask Jesus, I want you to be open to whatever He speaks to you over the next several days. Amen? Be open. Allow the Holy Spirit to move in you and through you. And allow whatever that manifestation may be, allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Amen? Hallelujah. When you're praying, and, and I just want to say this one more thing. We don't talk about this subject very often, probably not often enough, but well, how, how, how do I do it? Well, for one thing, the Holy Spirit doesn't open your mouth. Okay? I mean, you won't feel like something crying your lips. You, won't, you probably won't. I don't know you might, but again, I'm going to put God in the box. You probably won't feel that. But you know, I kind of look at it this way. If I tell you, don't think about a dog right now, how many of you just thought about a dog? Okay. Well, you know, don't try to get your mind in it and thinking about words you're going to say, but just just begin to speak, and and those syllables or words or whatever they might be, 
it, it'll come and you'll realize it's not you doing it. That's, only, that's the best way I can explain it. You'll realize it's not you thinking about these words. You're just speaking these words that are coming to you. Anybody else in here relate to that? Me? I'm the only one? <laughs> you guys are just bashful. You never raise your hands for anything. But, uh, but anyway, just... That's the best way to explain it. Because, you know, you can't be taught to do it. You shouldn't be anyway. You know, I mean, I've heard people say, now just say this. Just say this. I know what they're trying to do. They're just trying to prime you a little bit to get you going. But I, don't, I didn't need any priming. I mean, it just started coming. You know, that's why I don't try to have you come up here and say, okay, now try to do this. That's why I think maybe just in your own prayer time, as you open yourself up to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, you know, that's when it would. I believe it will flow the easiest. So just open yourself up to Him. Amen? And stay hungry for Him. And begin to recognize a new work that He's doing in your life. Amen? And you know, even though I've experienced this over 20 years ago, I'm still looking for a new work in my life. I'm believing for a new work in my life. You know, I've gone through some desert times. You know, I was going through a desert time when we started this church. To be honest with you, but I'm, I'm of the, the nature, you know what, you just keep plugging. You know, my emotions have nothing to do with the work of God. You just keep plugging and you keep plugging. And I want you to know I'm not in a desert anymore. You know, I, 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 I'm looking for rivers of flowing water to flow to me and through me. And to flow to you and through you, amen? And uh, let's see the Holy Spirit do a great work among us, amen? Hallelujah. God has great things in store. I believe with all my heart for Crosswalk Fellowship. And I believe He has great things in store for you because you are Crosswalk Fellowship. Amen? Amen.